11, I looked at the church's website and noticed that you all were in a Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel series, so I thought I'd better get on the ball and uh, look at the 1st Samuel chapter 11. Before we do that, before we read that, you know, recently there is a certain political candidate who is quite I'm not here to talk about politics today. I don't want to get into our taxpayer status and make you imagine a disciple church so we can kind of be on both sides of the aisle. That's kind of the disciple thing. But it's interesting that Mr. Trump and Mr. Sanders are tapping into anger. They're mad. They're raging against the system. But I thought, you know what? They're not the only people. I mean, I get mad pretty frequently. Do you get mad pretty frequently? I remember a couple of years ago at Hillbilly Days. Now, I love Hillbilly Days. But I got so furious at one of those vendors, who, you know, the $8 a ticket ride. I, got, I thought I was going to fist fight this guy. I'm a pacifist. I haven't been there in a long time. But, I mean, I'm furious. I'm throwing my finger up, popping up. most Americans that 45% of Americans report being very angry at their job. But that's not you, I'm sure. Um, 27% of nurses have been assaulted on their job. How about this? 33% of people have reported being on no speaking terms I wonder if it goes up if you're related to them. I suspect it does. One out of 20 said they have been in a fight with their next door neighbor. 1,486 reports last year about fights with stewardesses on the airplane. Now, here's this 50% of people report smacking their computer when having a computer problem. One in seven adults are being treated right now medically for stress-related conditions. Depression and anxiety are overwhelming our culture. We are mad. We are angry. Right? But we look so good. I mean, I got my church clothes on. Man, I'm wearing a white dress. I mean, I look good. I'm not mad. Right? Well, I want to read for you a passage where someone gets angry. Earlier we heard about Jesus getting a little angry. Yeah, I said that. Jesus got a little angry. 1 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to hear some great Old Testament names. So let's go there. Chapter 11, verse 1. About a month later, that pulls us to what happened earlier. Well, this king of the Ammonites, Nahash has just broken loose on a couple tribes. He's whipped them real good, and he sent 7,000 men fleeing. So we just kind of know what happened. There was a big fight about a month ago. Nahash has won the day. 7,000 people escaped, and Nahash is rocking and rolling. He's moving forward. Uh, he's taking names later, I guess. So Nahash, the Ammonite, went up, and he besieged the city called Gabesh. All the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us, and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I will make a treaty with you, namely, that I gouge out everyone's right eye, and thus put disgrace upon Israel. Now this kind of, you know now we're in the Old Testament. We're starting to talk about gouging people's eyes out. Yeah, we're there. Okay, so, verse 3, The elders of Jabesh said to them, Give us seven days' rest, so we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the hearing of the people. And all the people wept out loud. Dum, dum, dum. It's getting very, very serious. People are freaking out. Probably have the right eye gouged out. 
oil in, it looked bad. Verse 5. Now Saul was coming in from the field behind the oxen. Now, who is this Saul? Right? Tall guy, kind of shy, hid behind some bags, just named what? The king. He's just been named the king over all the land. He's coming in after plowing the land all day. Okay. So Saul then says, what is the matter with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the message from the inhabitants of Jabez, and the Spirit of God came upon Saul in the power when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen, he cut them in pieces, and he sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one. Now imagine, he gets so outraged that he cuts up the oxen that he's working with, chops them into pieces, sends them out to all the territory, and says, this is what's going to happen to your farm animals if you don't get behind them. Kind of creepy, right? Kind of nasty. Who would like to be the deliverer of those pieces? Bloody pieces like, here you go, message from the king. When he mustered them at Bezek, those from Israel were 300,000, and those from Judah, 70,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus shall you say to the inhabitants of Jabez Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have deliverance. And when the messengers came and told the inhabitants of Jabez, they rejoiced. So the inhabitants of Jabez said, Tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, you may do to us whatever seems good to you. Now, this is great. This is like me in high school. You run your mouth all you can because you know there are three guys who are twice the size of anyone else in school right behind you. Hey, tomorrow, we're going to make a treat for you. Just come out and meet us tomorrow. It's going to be all great. They have, what, 370,000 people waiting. They play all in Sure, okay, no problem. So, let's see what happens. The next day, verse 11, Saul put the people in three companies. At the morning watch, they came into the camp and they cut down the Ammonites until the heat of the day and those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The people said to Samuel, Who is it that said, Shall Saul rule over us? Give them to us so we may put them to death. See, the blood could not be stopped. Once they got this ball rolling, they had a great day. They thrashed the brains out of Nahash's group, and they're on a roll, and they're saying, bring anybody else who wants to fight us. We're ready to go. But Saul said, no one shall be put to death today. Today the Lord has brought the living. Today the Lord has brought the living. I don't know about you. But when I think about anger, being angry, I get a little nervous. I like to dismiss people. I'm one of those people that wants to never want to be wrong. So when my wife, yes, my wife, raises her voice and gets a little angry, I'm like, oh, 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 you know. When my kids want to get upset at something, oh. When I'm at church meeting, when I'm at the university, which of course never happens, I, oh, it's not violent. Sometimes anger is a good thing. Especially when we're at We always have a right. Right? I deserve being mad about this. But you don't. <laughs> now I wonder in this passage today, what can we learn about anger? What can we learn about justice? And what can we learn about God's involvement? Well, I'm struck by this reality, that in the midst of Nahash's victory, that God's people were so quick to surrender. 
I mean, Nahash hadn't even done anything. He just comes to Jabesh Gilead and says, we're going to fight you. And they're like, oh, we're done. Now, remember in the first Gulf War, when the Americans had invaded Iraq, and there were Iraqi soldiers, They were given up without a fight. So this is what the Israelites were doing. They were giving up without a fight. Now, can you imagine that here's the treat. I'm going to make you a bargain day, brother. I don't want to tell my manager, but I'm going to do this for you. Okay? We're going to make a deal and kind of agree to it, make this covenant true. There has to be some shedding of blood, so I'm going to rip out your right eye. How about that, brother? Oh, it sounds good, right? Hey, I got two. Why not? Well, why do you think? rip out their right eye. What do you think? To mark them? Okay. Anything else? It's going to bring shame. Right? Is there any practical reason behind this? To weaken them. Imagine fighting with one eye. Your aim would be a little off. Trying to do a slingshot or a bow and arrow. Easy target. Now I wonder for us, with the injustices around us, how often are we so willing and so easy to surrender? But you know, Randy, things around here are never going to change. Right? Now I think you've never said that. Or how about, well, you know, those people, those people, they deserve what they're getting. And I know they can't preach. I know they don't know much. Garbage, but they deserve it. Sometimes we have a habit also of even participating in this. Well, if things aren't going to change, at least I'm going to get mine. See, we have a habit of surrendering to the injustice of them. And we don't even think that we are. Turns out we haven't even started to fight. We're already ready. But I'm glad that Saul was ready to fight. I am glad that Saul, when he got behind those two oxen, and he stepped out and he said, "Uh uh-uh, not on my watch. Now this is very odd because Saul normally isn't the one that we praise in Scripture. Saul's the one that we're usually throwing under the bus. Because we're waiting on David, the mighty warrior. But this moment, Saul is furious. And turns out, this is the uncomfortable piece for me. Who gives Saul this finger? God. God overwhelms him. We think, usually, surely the presence of the Lord is here. I can see it like an angel's face. You think, oh, when God shows up, we're just like, Right? We're just peaceful, kind of semi-floating. No, God showed up and Saul is ready to split some throats. God shows up in a synagogue with a woman who had been bent over for 18 years. When God showed up, he broke the Sabbath rule, he healed this woman, and then he goes toe-to-toe with the religious leaders and says, how dare you? When God shows up sometimes, Now, I know about the things that make me upset, right? When I'm inconvenienced at the grocery store and the line's too long, when people don't agree with me, when my job inconveniences me, when my car doesn't run, these things all make me furious. But what about the things that should make me happy? The fact that we have the second highest overdose rate in the state of Kentucky. And that should make us serious. The fact that we have kids in our county who go home and are starving. That domestic violence and child sexual abuse is way skyrocketing. These things make us mad. It should make us mad when people pat us on the head and say, oh, with all these losses and cold jobs, these poor people need to be 
thus have no future. We should get mad when people think that we're only the element in our ground. We should get upset about all these injustices. We should get upset that there are more people now dying in the Congo in the last 15 years than died in the Holocaust. We should get mad when we're trying to raise money to build a school in Haiti that costs $19,000, but people with their $600 cell phones say, I don't have any money to get to that cost. Those kids need to keep me in Those things should make us furious. But we don't want to get angry. We want to be good church people. We want to play the game, smile the face, sing the song, and go home. And you know what? The enemy says, great, I love your appetite keep it up, because I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to keep, keep being on the aggressive. I'm going to keep being on the offensive, and you will lose every time. Our community will lose every time, and our kids will be punished because we choose to be dead. I want to be dead. This church, that first Christian church, downtown Pikeville, South, will be willing to pray this prayer. God, I want to talk about turning on the radio and listening to preachers, and they'll be happy to tell you about all the things that God's mad about, because I'm not sure they're always right. But you pray. You ask the Lord to say, God, start connecting me with your heart, because in your heart there is some anger, and I want to connect with that, because I want to be able to do something about it. It turns out, when the Israelites are willing to surrender, Saul gets upset, and then Saul kind of goes a little Old Testament, right? Cuts up the ox and sends them out, and what does Saul learn? Well, these 7,000 men who earlier had come and hid, those 7,000 men were a whole lot more. They were 370,000 troops. What we're going to find out is when we connect with God's anger and we start battling injustice, we're going to find out there's a whole lot more with us than there are against us. I wonder about a prophet named Elisha who was surrounded by the enemy troops opens the door and like, this is going to be a bad day, right? And the angel says, boom, look around you. And there were angels all on the mountainside. I wonder about, remember Gideon? Soldiers lapping the water. Gideon says, I just don't think we can win the battle. God says, well, you know, you cut 10,000 more off and then we're going to win the day. I wonder about Elijah who said, kill me, God, because no one worships you. And God said, I have thousands more who have to bow there We think we're all alone. We surrender to apathy. Sometimes we think we just God is inviting you today to start being mad. Start getting angry at things that make him mad. And then you will search out others. You say, you know what burns me up? And they're going to say, that burns me up too. And then rather than just having a pity party and saying, someone should do something about that. I got a word from the Lord for you. Check this out. Here it is. Keep your matter. It matches God's anger. Congratulations. You now have a ministry. God is called. I'm glad Saul got up. I'm glad that Saul got mad. I, I love my two eyes. If he doesn't get mad, I'm walking around being like, hey, welcome to church. I'm glad that he got mad. Today's the Lord.